you have your Bibles this morning, our text is Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 29 this morning. We're continuing our study on faith and what it looks like. And we come to just one verse, verse number 29, which says, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, attempting to do, were drowned. And so this morning we're going to look at the idea here of the children of Israel crossing over the Red Sea. And you need to understand with this story, it is so connected to the Exodus account with the last um, judgment that fell with the, the firstborn being taken and now the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, it is the greatest act of redemptive history in all of Israel. Listen to the song that was sung after Israel crossed the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 15, <clears throat> verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he is become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord Yahweh is a man of war. <clears throat> the Lord is his name. And as we understand the connection here with the Exodus account, that these two events merge together, it again shows us God's awesome salvation and his deliverance. And so don't lose sight of this event. It's important. And not only that, this event is continuously used throughout the entire Old Testament to remind God's people of deliverance and salvation. <clears throat> In the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah, this event of the crossing of the Red Sea of the Exodus account is spoken to those in captivity in Babylon, reminding them that they too would be delivered and saved just like the Hebrews of old. As we move into the New Testament, it is, that, it, is that, it, is, it is exactly this idea of salvation and deliverance that is a foretaste of what Jesus Christ has done for his people. Paul says it well when he talks about our situation. He says that we were without Christ. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. We were without hope and without God in the world. But now, Jesus Christ has made us nigh through the blood. He has brought peace to us, and he has offered reconciliation to God by the cross. And so this theme of God's awesome deliverance and salvation, we see it in Exodus chapter 14 and 15, but we must understand that it's our story as well. And so we'll look at this event and the faith of God's people to cross the Red Sea this morning. So let's look at the context if we can. Uh, Exodus chapter 14, starting at verse number 5. <clears throat> Remember, the last act of justice was just served to Egypt. The firstborn would die unless a lamb was taken, an innocent lamb, the blood was shed, and it was applied to the doors. And wherever the blood was on the door, those families were spared. They were saved. And so this has just happened. Egypt wakes up, and they're in pandemonium. Every household would have been affected by this. And so they thrust out the Israelites. And after they're gone, after they left, an exodus of, of maybe two million plus people, Here's what it says in verse number 5 of chapter 14. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? Why in the world have we let them go? And it just dawned on them that they had free access to two million slaves who would do their bidding and build their pyramids. And now they just release them. And so, they have a plan. Verse 6, And he made ready his chariot, and took his people, and he took 600 chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, and captain, captains over every one of them. Pharaoh understands what has just happened. He now wants them back. And so he calls up the army. 
600 chosen chariots, and then all the rest of the chariots of Egypt. And, and we have to understand with this event, in modern times, this would be like a tank division or tank battalions. And so Pharaoh now is angry. He's lost his workforce, and he's going back to get them. Remember, they are civilians. They were slaves just days before this. And so look at Exodus 14, verse 10. <clears throat> and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Uh, now listen to me. Uh, understand that here they are, and, and they have strategically been led by God to a camp where on each side are mountains, and before them is the Red Sea. And now with their bags packed, their tents, their pots, their pans, they're camped out, and they look behind them, and here is the army of Pharaoh. These people have no military training. They are slave laborers, and they cry out to God. And I want you to feel their despair right now. They're in great fear, fear. They are scared to death, and rightly so. Last week they were slaves. Today they are free. And now it looks as if they will die. And certainly we understand their fearfulness. But now listen to their response in verse number 11. And they said to Moses, after they, they, they realized the situation, they cried to Moses and they said, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've brought us to the wilderness? I mean, was Egypt too small of a place that you took all two million of us out into the desert to bury us? Then they say this, Why did you even bring us out of Egypt? Didn't we tell you to leave us alone so that we could serve the Egyptians? In verse 12, the, the last part of this verse, it, it just floors me. Here's what they say. It would have been better for us to be slaves than to die. <laughs> it's better that we were slaves than to die right now. Um, when I was a kid, and many of you may not understand this unless you're my age, but there was a, uh, a phrase that we would say that I said, and it was, it was this, I would rather be dead than red. Anybody here remember that phrase? If you're, okay, if you're 50 or over, you might remember that phrase. I, I hear the Buick, 1977 Buick. Yeah, there's another old person there. Thank you. Um, but the idea was that it was a time of the Cold War, and communism and Marxism was a real threat and a problem, and we had seen the oppression, and we said, listen, this is a bad deal. I would rather live free than to be under that type of regime. It's funny how times have changed. Now we think democracy is a problem. I like what Winston Churchill said. He said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other forms that have been tried over time. I think that's true. And we think today that if we just had communism or Marxism, we'd be in good shape. But let me remind our younger generation, you ought to read a book on history. Because these regimes have killed a hundred million, conservatively speaking, a hundred million people have lost their lives to these types of governments. And yet, what these Hebrews say is this, I would rather be red than dead. You should have left us in Egypt. We should have remained slaves. We'd rather be there. And this is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous comment. And so here they are, the people of God. They're terrified. Now they're, they're, they're ridiculous in their response to all of this. And here's what God says to them in the midst of it. Verse number 15. And the Lord said to Moses, Wherefore cry thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, and go forward. Here are people, of course, now we can see little faith, great fear, and yet God says to them, go forward. Now listen, we have to understand how strange of a command this would be. If you're among the crowd of two million, you're now enclosed by mountains to both sides, an army behind you that wants to do you harm, and a sea before you. They're terrified. 
They're terrified. Have you ever tried to move someone who was afraid? I mean, really afraid. Years ago, we, we took our, at the time, just our two boys, AJ and Greg, to an amusement park. And, and Greg was a little skittish about a roller coaster, but we talked him in. We got into line. And as we were working our way through over an hour wait, you could tell as we got closer, he became more and more anxious. And finally, after an hour of waiting, we were ready to get on the ride. And, and Greg was having none of it. He was like freaking out. He was climbing up me and holding on to me. And so I did the walk of shame. Um, AJ and his mom went on the ride, and I carried my 15-year-old son back to the car. I'm not sure he was 15. I, I just think he was about 15. Um, he was terrified. And I think sometimes we read these portions of Scripture, and we look at the characters of the Bible, and we think, oh, how ridiculous are they to do that or to respond like that? And I've heard believers say when talking about Peter, can you believe Peter? I mean, he's on the water, he's walking with Jesus, and then he takes a look at the winds and the waves, and he starts to think, if I were Peter, really? Really? The same people who can't get out of bed on Sunday morning consistently, but you're going to walk on the water with Jesus? Right? The same people who can't be faithful in our own personal times in the Word, right? But we would be different. These people were terrified. And I have to think in my own heart, with my own nature, I would be in the same position. They were scared. And not only that, the sea was before them. Their bags were packed. Their tents were with them. All of their possessions. And God says to them, hey, move forward. In what mind, honestly, does that make any sense? Think about that. That Moses comes speaking on behalf of God and tells the children of Israel, it's okay, just move forward. It doesn't make any sense. We live in a world today, and, and it's, it's scary to me that, that George Orwell is hitting it more times than not. He says, the further that a society drifts away from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. And certainly we see that. But even in the life of the church, we see the commands of God, like just go forward. And, and it just doesn't make sense. And, and of course, the world, the natural man, can't receive those things. They're foolishness to him. But I've got to be honest, as you think about the word of God, have you heard the commands of Christ lately? On what he tells his believers and followers to do? He tells us to love our enemies and to pray for them. In what world does that make sense to love people who have harmed you? He goes on to say that it's better to lose your life for me because that's when you find it. How does that make sense when all we know is this life and what we see and what we feel and what we touch? He then says, forgive, release, those who have hurt you, those who have been unkind or malicious, to just let that go and release that. <laughs> How does that make sense in a world that says, do unto others before they do it to you? You, you need to think about what God has told his people. These commands, like going forward, sometimes we read them and think nothing of them, and, and then follow that through. Christ lives, he dies, he rises again, the church is born. And then the apostles write to us and tell us, these are, how, these are the commands that Jesus has for you, this is how he wants you to live. In this world, they don't make sense. Jesus says to husbands this morning, pour your life out for your wife. Love her like I love the church. Self-sacrifice. Does it make sense? when I live for myself in my self-centered world? The apostles go on to tell us that we're to flee fornication in a, in a world where our sexuality is just in our faces nonstop. 
Why in the world would anyone do that, let alone a young Christian person? He then goes into our workplace and says to us, Hey, at work, work as if Jesus is watching. Don't be like everyone else who is ripping the boss off and when they're not around, messing around. But your work has meaning. It's eternal. There's a purpose. Work is unto the Lord. That just doesn't make sense at all. Unless the narrative is true and we were created for much more. And in the beginning, we grasped what didn't belong to us. Some reality that, 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 that we would be our own gods and we would decide for ourselves what's right and wrong. And we plunge this world into chaos, despair, destruction, and death. And God could have left us there, but in his love and his kindness, he took upon flesh and Jesus Christ walked among us to give us a taste of what it looks like to be really human. To love the God and Father the Creator. To please Him and to fellowship with Him. To receive His love and give it to others and pour out ourself. And everywhere Jesus went, He touched the broken. He brought healing and life and comfort and peace and joy to give us a glimpse of what it means, of what we were created for, to live a life that truly reflects God. And what he did was to give us his spirit so that you and I are like these little outposts of the kingdom to say this is the reality of the life that we live. This is what we were created for. And I can love. I can forgive. I can work as unto the Lord. I can pour myself out. And it might not make sense as you see it. But it's true and it's right and it's pleasing. And so this is a strange command. They're scared and the sea is before them. And yet with their little faith, and their great fear, they move forward. They move forward. And this is such a great act, even in the midst of their fear and their ridiculous response, that it's recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 for us to see and to follow. And I would say to you this morning, brother and sister in Christ, for many of us, who are fearful as we really understand the commands of God. The word is true for us as well. He tells us to move forward, to believe, to trust, to take that step. Now, we'll, we'll revisit this in a moment, but I want to point out something else that I find fascinating. We skipped the portion of Scripture in, in Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14 that Andrew read. But let me, let me refresh your memory. Because here are people who are scared, the sea is in front of them, they have this ridiculous response, and you would think by their initial response they would not move, but they do. But notice how they're reassured by Moses. Here they are, they see the situation, it's a dire situation, and they're complaining and they're saying, what are we doing here, Moses? And Moses stands up and listen to what he says. He says to this crowd of nearly two million people shaking in their sandals, Fear not. Stand still. Stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you. Only hold your peace and be silent. And here we see Moses' faith in Yahweh, in the God of heaven, elevating the faith of others who have little to no faith. Again, it's the example that the author in Hebrews is reminding of, us of that we are to follow in the footsteps, that we can find comfort, courage, believe, and obey. And when we do this, we have the opportunity to encourage those around us to follow suit. And you might say this morning, well, of course, that's Moses, the great man of faith. Of course, he's standing in front of this congregation of two million, and he's encouraging them and prodding them on to move forward in faith. It's Moses. But let me remind you of the same Moses, maybe a year or so prior to this. In Exodus chapter 3, after the Lord hears the cry of his people, 
and he decides to send out a deliverer, he chooses Moses. And he finds him in the backside of the desert. He's tending sheep, minding his own business. And all of a sudden he sees this burning bush. It's on fire. And it's not being consumed. And he says, that's strange. I'm going to take a peek at that. So he moses on over, and as he does, he hears his voice and says, Hey, buddy, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And when Moses is here, when he hears the word of the Lord, he's terrified. He's terrified. He falls on his face, and he buries it in the ground. And the Lord says, I am Yahweh, and I've chosen you to deliver my people. Now listen to the great faith of Moses, some some about a year prior to this last statement that he made. He says, who am I? What are you talking about? Who am I that I should do this? And Yahweh reminds him of that I will be with you. He then says in chapter 3, verse number 13, I don't even know your name. He continues in chapter 4, they won't believe me, they won't listen to me, you've got the wrong guy. He then makes the excuse that he can't speak well. He maybe st he stammers a little bit, and he stutters, and, and this is just not going to work. And finally, in chapter 4, verse number 13, he says, God, please, please, send someone else. It doesn't sound like a man of great faith by any stretch of the imagination. But after a year, he stands and he encourages others to follow him in his faith. What has happened? I'll tell you what has happened. Moses has interacted with the character of God. He knows the God who has heard the cry of his people, who loves his people, who has their best interest in mind, who promised to deliver. And he's reviewed God's action with him over this last year of his life. He's been faithful. He sees his character he watches the claims of God on his own life. And time and time again, he has seen God's word followed and God come through. Ten times he's witnessed now God moving in their midst. And even on the night of the Passover, when he tells them the angel of death is coming, he believes God in such a way that he doesn't tell them to go outside and watch and send a and, and set a, someone at the door to make sure he just simply trusts the God of heaven. He has come in contact with the God of heaven. He has interacted with, with him. He has seen his true character and the claims on his life, and it's changed him. And my dear brother and sister in Christ, for many of us who've been in our faith for a long time, we go through these motions of going to church or even reading our devotions, but our faith is not grown to where we can reassure others because we have not come in contact with him. We've not viewed his character. We've not reviewed his actions in our life as we followed his claims. And so we must become that. The need of the hour for today, as it was for the people of Israel, is that we must by faith move forward. For some of you here, your moving forward in faith is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Or if you're listening this morning by way of our online service, there's something that piqued your interest to listen. Maybe you've been coming here. Maybe you've been hearing the message. But for you, it's time to move forward and trust Christ. And again, this faith is not some far-fetched, oh, this, this fairy tale of Jesus. He was a historic person who lived, who preached, who performed miracles, who showed humanity what it meant to be truly human and to follow God. And the ultimate act of love, he stepped into our place. The perfect Lamb of God bore the wrath of God on his head so that you and I could be delivered, so that you and I could go free, so that you and I could be saved and the people of God. And this morning, for you, it might be the simple act of calling upon his name and trusting him. But you're afraid. Because you know that coming to Jesus is going to change your life. And my friend, it will. 
but it will change your life for eternity and it will bring you into reconciliation with the God of heaven and you will come in, in line with the man or the woman you were designed to be and so move forward. For others of us this morning who know Christ, there's a command that we have heard and it doesn't make sense to us. Right? We, we're sort of, we're, we're making our excuses. We're fearful because we know if we follow him in this area, in our homes, with our families, with our friends, with our finances, if we really step out and believe what God said, things will change. I might miss out. I might be rejected. I might be mocked. I might miss a promotion. I might be ridiculed by my neighbors. People might not understand. It might get worse. And the truth is, it might get worse. We'll see next week that for God's people of faith, it's not always sunshine and roses. Jesus didn't promise that all of your wildest dreams would come true. That's a different gospel. Jesus promised if you followed me, it would not be easy. So why do it? Because you have life and life eternal. And he is good. And he has your best interest in mind. And it is ultimately for your good and God's glory. But you and I need to see what God said clearly. And by faith, move forward. Move forward. We must understand that God loves us. And on Calvary, he has already declared that we are adored, that we are the apple of his eye, that we have been accepted. We have value, worth, and dignity as, as, as sons and daughters of God. What more could we ask for? What does it matter than what comes, no matter what happens in our lives? If we listen to his word, if we move forward, we have relationship with the God of heaven. We are safe, and he's promised to take us all the way home. And his promises are good. He is good. He is kind. He is gracious. And he is worthy. And we, as the children of Israel of old, must pray, God, help us to move forward. And so my brother and sister in Christ this morning, I guarantee in your life as in mine, as God has spoken to you this week, wherever he has planted you, there is some command that is, it just hits you smack in the face and, and you're making excuses why you can't do this. And ultimately they're ridiculous. And I would encourage you this morning to by faith trust him and move forward. And for others of us this morning, it is time for us to interact with the God of heaven. To review in his life his faithfulness to have him build and strengthen our faith so that as we interact with one another in this community of those who are afraid to do whatever he's called them to do, that we can say, listen, stand firm, hold still. God will be faithful. See his salvation. This chapter of faith is amazing. And what I find amazing is that here are people of great fear, and little faith, and yet they move forward, and they're found in the chapter of faith. And here we have Moses, who a year prior to this was, was in no condition whatsoever to encourage anyone. And yet through time, with interaction with the character of God, with seeing his faithfulness, comes to a place where he's used to encourage millions of others to follow him. And so my brother and sister in Christ this morning, are you afraid? Are you fearful? Is your faith small? I would just remind you that God has commanded us to move forward. And whatever that step is, by faith, take it. And wherever it leads, take it. Because our God has commanded us, we must move forward. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this example that we have seen. And Lord, I pray that you would examine our hearts as well. Lord, bring to mind areas this week in our life or the battles that we've been facing about clear commands that you have given us to move forward in whatever you've called us to do at work, with our finances, 
in our home situation, in our neighborhoods, with our personal convictions, in things that we must add or get rid of. Lord, help us to trust you and to follow you. And help us just in our fear, knowing that we are afraid. Lord, forgive us, but give us the strength that we need to take this next step. Lord, help us. I pray that we would be a community of people who will grow in our faith in such a way that we can encourage our spouses, we can encourage our children, we can encourage the weak believers around us to take those same steps. May we be a community of people who live by faith, who walk by faith, and who grow in our faith. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.